Yes, uh, Willem, thank you so much for the invitation and thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, also, just, I guess, as, as, a, as a point of departure, um, I am moving to the Institute uh, uh, from the Institute of Political Science in Leiden, I'm moving to the Institute of Social Studies at um, Erasmus University Rotterdam, which explains why the slide is using the EUR uh, PowerPoint than uh, the Leiden. Uh, the paper came about as a, a sort of the academic intellectual think piece of a consulting work that we did for the UN Research and Social Development, UNRIST. UNRIST had a massive project back in 2013 looking at how resource-rich countries can finance poverty reduction. They've done this project in Africa, in Latin America, and then in Asia. We did the case study on the Philippines. And then six, seven years after, this paper um, got formed around, an, uh, we tried to formulate an intellectual argument around what we think um, state capacity means for poverty reduction, but in particular, how mining under certain conditions support uh, poverty reduction. So that's the sort of the intellectual logic behind uh, the, the project. I think just it's just going to be a straightforward outline. There is a paper that is currently under review. Um, and we think that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a straightforward structure we'll follow. I'll first talk about the context and the question of the project. I'll talk about um, the significance of uh, uh, looking at state capacity and, and, and how this idea of state capacity fits in broad debates around natural resource politics and governance. And then I'll talk about how we are trying to reframe the debate from resource curse, from the rentier politics towards, and oriented this, orient this towards the question of the state. Then we'll present to you uh, our framework, and then I'll talk about uh, the Philippine case study, applying the framework to the case study, and then some lessons drawn more broadly in terms of mining governance. Okay. So I think I'll start with uh, the key question and what we are trying to do in the paper. Uh, there is a lot of literature on mining arguing that, um, that extractive industries, so when I say extractive industries, I basically refer to oil, gas, and mining. Um, but in particular, in this paper, we'll be talking about large-scale mining. Uh, the general and established wisdom on mining is that extractive industries tend to generate anti-developmental outcomes. They have There are so many econometric studies that show high levels of export dependence leads to uh, negative growth rates and uh, that it's bad for industrialization, it's bad for manufacturing and agriculture, and that it could generate and exacerbate poverty and inequality. So this is the general established literature. We call this the resource curse. Uh, on the other hand, there is a subset of literature within the resource curse or, uh, uh, paradigm, which is the rentier politics, which focuses on rent seeking. Now, by definition, rents are uh, super profits. Rents are profits that you accumulate from um, certain economic activities. In this particular case, we're talking about mineral rents, rents that come from natural resource exports. Rentier politics basically argues that um, countries that have access to high levels, high amounts of rents, in this particular case, mineral rents, oil rents, tend to generate conflicts and political contestation. And so countries that are dependent, that are increasingly dependent for their revenues, for their fiscal resources from uh, to mining, they tend to have uh, difficulties in dealing with the political implications, meaning that um, you know the conflicts that abound over access and competition for mineral rents. And uh, political groups, social groups mobilize in competition with the state to get access to these rents. Um, different economic elites want part of these rents as well. So the general idea is that um, natural resource activities 
are make it very difficult to establish a what we call political settlement, an agreement uh, uh, between the states and the, elite, uh, the the industrial, the economic elites and the state, but also the state and the citizens. And for that reason, I think the empirical evidence that we find um, in the past um, uh, 10, 15 years on the natural resource uh, literature in resource economics and political economy is that poverty reduction, which is what I would, so when I speak about social development, I mainly refer to poverty reduction and, and um, uh, welfare. Uh, so poverty reduction during the commodity boom has become uneven across the global south. Some countries were able to do really good at it. For example, the Latin American left governments had uh, extraordinary records of poverty reduction, even left a dent in inequality. Whereas other countries, in particular in Africa, in, in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, mineral, rent, mineral rents, the high mineral rents didn't really translate into substantive poverty gains. Now, I think theoretically we challenge some of the main arguments of the resource curse and rentier models, rentier state models. For one, uh, the argument makes sense only if it, and it only applies in cases where there's high levels of resource dependence. So meaning maybe you will observe some of these arguments in the case of Congo, in the case of Angola and Tanzania, because these are low capacity states, high levels of dependence on natural resource exports. But maybe you don't see this that often in the context of uh, Brazil, for example, or Malaysia, where there is high levels of natural resource exports, but also that there are other uh, types of, of uh, uh, economic activities uh, that, that, that Malaysia, Malaysia is involved with, namely manufacturing and high, and high value services. The resource curse as well is less applicable to middle income countries, particularly the high middle income countries. So again, here I think the rationale behind it is because political capacity and institutional capacity of, institu of, 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 of state institutions matter. They can mitigate the resource curse effects. They can mitigate rent seeking. They can redistribute mineral rents more effectively than others. And finally, I think we have a general idea, general literature that argues that um, uh, state capacity is something that you can uh, uh, conceptualize, but in, in a static way. So I think it's important to understand that state capacity is something that is evolving, that is historically constituted. So it's a process-based uh, uh, notion of state capacity that might be able, that might be uh, uh, useful in uh, trying to understand the politics of, of mineral extraction. So that's one of the main limit theoretical limitations of, of the resource scarce frontier state models. However, I think empirically in the real world, we've observed something else that was taking place from 2000 onwards. The World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and other multilateral institutions began to argue that under certain conditions, poverty reduction is possible uh, 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 for, for, for mineral economies. And so the idea of responsible mining came about. The idea that with the right socio-environmental safeguards, mining can deliver poverty gains. So I guess the question that our project, our paper asked, is under what conditions can large-scale mining deliver poverty gains, not only for national economic development, but also gains for the communities. What are we saying in the paper? What are we trying to argue here? What we're saying is to understand the complexity of poverty reduction, to understand the difficulty of dealing with uh, natural resource governance, we need to zoom in to the state and in particular state capacity. And so we think that state capacity is the explanation why there are so much differences in terms of poverty reduction outcomes across resource rich countries. And in particular, we identified two aspects, two dimensions of state capacity 
the extractive power and the infrastructural power of the state. When we talk about extractive power, we mean the power to tax and spend these mineral rents for poverty reduction, for infrastructure spending, for allocation towards investments, et cetera, et cetera. So the ability to tax, to, to collect rents and then spend them effectively. We also talk about infrastructural power. And here we draw from the concept of the sociologist Michael Mann. Uh, infrastructural power is the ability of the state to bargain with contentious actors. But in particular, in the context of mining, we argue that infrastructural power is about mitigating political conflicts. And this is particularly important in the case of mining because it's an extremely contentious, controversial sector. It generates very high political opposition from civil society, from mining communities, and from uh, the public, the general public. And we say that without addressing these two dimensions, if mining reforms don't address the need to expand and strengthen infra infrastructural and extractive power, we think we're missing a lot. Uh, we're, we're missing a lot uh, in terms of how poverty reduction can work better in the context of mineral extraction. Um, the case that we're talking about here is the Philippines. Uh, we did several rounds of field work. Uh, it's a paper written with uh, Pascal Hatcher from uh, University of Canterbury in New Zealand and Professor Jean Grugel at York University in the UK. So we did the, the consulting work together. We did field work back in 2013 for the project, for the consulting work, and then in 2016, uh, when I was uh, uh, a JSPS fellow at the University of Tokyo, I conducted more field work. And in particular, I went to one of the mines, field work site, is, uh, uh, one of the mine, uh, mining province, Surigao del Norte, in the Taganito mine. The case focus is on large scale mining as opposed to small scale or artisanal mining. Our framework. We we suggest that the key to understanding why mining generates a lot of problems with respect to poverty reduction is the key there is, is, is to unpack state capacity. State capacity, simply put, is um, the institutional, organizational, bureaucratic capacity of the state to implement governing projects. It is based on expanding territorial reach, penetrating territorial reach, resources, human expertise, and organizational coherence. So the stronger your state capacity is, the more able the state is at coordinating and organizing public policy. There is a vast literature in political science and public administration talking about multiple dimensions of state capacity across different policy fields, across different geographical and temporal contexts. However, for this paper, we focus on three different dimensions. We think that these are the three dimensions that are essential to understand mining and poverty reduction. A, the ability of the state to exercise legitimate use of force. B, the extractive power, the fiscal power of the state to collect and allocate mineral rent or taxes. And this is where redistribution and distribution of, 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 of resources matter. And third, the infrastructural power of the state or the ability to negotiate with uh, civil and political society. And here, the most important part of state capacity is managing political conflicts. By managing political conflicts, you legitimize mining, you compensate for communities, and therefore you generate a social contract between the state and citizens. Now, we think that in the literature, there's a general differentiation between, the, there are two different notions of state capacity. And here I highlight, and there is a table in the paper highlighting the differences between a more neoliberal market-oriented regulatory state and a more developmentalist vision of the state in the context of mining. I think the most important aspects in this, I'm not going to go through them. You can have a look at it in the paper, but also in the slides that were distributed. I think the emphasis with neoliberal regulation, regulatory state is 
A, the state emphasizes competitiveness and the significance of foreign investment as the source of growth. So technology transfer can happen only through foreign investment and the private sector, basically. And then B, it's about building institutional capabilities in order to support the private sector. So it's a very different notion of development. It's a very different understanding of regulation. And finally, as a way to mitigate conflicts, there is an affinity between neoliberal regulations and relying on corporate social responsibility. Because the state takes a step back in conflict management, because the state takes a step back from economic and productive activities, it relies a lot on multinational companies, on private companies to, 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 to replace and substitute state functions. By contrast, uh, in a more developmentalist idea of mining, the state plays a more active role. It plays a huge role in the public uh, uh, sphere. In the, in, uh, it acts as an entrepreneurial state. For example, it, uh, it's about building uh, an effective and, and efficient public enterprise, state-owned enterprise. It's about um, using mineral extraction towards industrial policy, towards industrialization and export diversification. So in a sense, there's a stronger uh, understand, there's an understanding of state capacity as planning, as a function of planning. It's about strengthening socio-environmental provisions, even if it can adversely challenge the interests of private companies. And that there is a lot more willingness on the part of the state to renegotiate taxes, fiscal policies, to, to increase mineral rents in order to maximize profits and then mobilize them for poverty reduction. And finally, in terms of conflict mitigation, you can always find you can often find a lot of corporatist type bargaining, institutionalized forms of negotiations, particularly with mining unions. But also, uh, we find we often find we oftentimes find more paternalistic types of relationship between communities and the state, or between the community and and between the communities and the companies. So the state mediates uh, these conflicts. Now let's zoom into the discussion of what happened in in the Philippines and why we think state capacity matters. Uh, the general story, whenever you read about mining, is that um, the Philippines has adopted the most market-friendly uh, mining regime. To some extent, we think, and we I mean, I've written a lot about this. Yes, that's true. Um, we do see very strong private sector-oriented uh, market reforms in the mining sector. But I think there's a slight shift in the mining regime from unfettered neoliberalism to more what we call responsible mining. Now, the fundamental basis of mining, the cornerstone of mining policy in the Philippines is the 1996 Mining Act proposed by, by then, uh, Senator Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. It is part of a second wave set of reforms to deepen the liberalization project in the Philippines. The first wave me is is related to restructuring the debt and uh, controlling and, and establishing macroeconomic stability. The most important provision of the 1996 Mining Act is the allocation of mineral contracts through what we call the FDAA. The, um, FDAAs are essentially um, it allows foreign companies. To, with uh, investments above uh, from 50 million US dollars and above to own concessions, to own mining sites, mining contracts. And in so doing, it circumvents some of the historically, uh, the historic constitutional constraints. So in the, in the, in the, in the Philippine constitution, foreign ownership, 100% foreign ownership is not allowed in strategic industries. Mining is one of them. Uh, but through the 1996 Mining Act, this was circumvented so companies can own uh, uh, through FTAs. And under her presidency, when she became president in 2001, all the way to 2010, mining became a centerpiece of her growth policy in her growth strategy. 
partly as a response to the lack of fiscal resources. Remember that we had a fiscal crisis back in 2003. Um, but partly because she genuinely believed in uh, uh, the role of the private sector in large-scale mining. So one of the most important changes under Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo was the elimination of major legal obstacles for FDI, for mining FDI through uh, at the Supreme Court. So she was able to take out all the legal battles. She was able to win the legal battles that would allow foreign investment in the mining sector to come in. Now, parallel to all these processes, international dynamics and the international context was also changing. In 2003, the World Bank issued an independent commission called the Extractive Industries Initiative, EII. And this commission basically looked at the role of the World Bank in the extractive sector. It looked at whether the extractive industry can play a role in development, in particular poverty reduction. They concluded, the commission concluded that the World Bank can still play a role in poverty reduction in the mineral sector, in the mineral economies, if good governance reforms are implemented. And this is where the concept of responsible mining comes in. So there's an agreement, a tacit agreement amongst the World Bank and other donor agencies that mining had generated public opposition, that mining had negative effects on growth, uh, as the resource curse argues, and that you know it could actually create problems because it competes with manufacturing and agriculture. Responsible mining was their response to uh, the need to commit to extractive industries-led growth. And I think this is important because we should remember that not all countries have pursued manufacturing as the pathway to economic development. A lot of the developing world, a lot of countries in the developing world, at least two thirds, are resource based or resource intensive economies. So this is the donor agency setting the agenda on how to reform the extractive sector. In the Philippines, in response to the problems of the mining industry, uh, Noino Yakino issued uh, Executive Order 79, which creates a temporary ban on future mining contracts, whilst the government was trying to find a way to establish a new mining tax, a new mining law. Um, it was a response because it was about integrating socio-environmental safeguards into regulatory frameworks. And so it was a way to remedy some of the problems that are emerging or that come from the 1996 Mining Act. Uh, again, the context here is that because we don't have a new mining law, EO79 kind of became a remedy to some of the problems associated with um, the extractive sector. Now, this is where we start looking into the extractive and infrastructural power of the state. What did these mining reforms do in the Philippine uh, uh, mining industry? What was the outcome? The first clear observation based on the evidence is that despite all the changes in the mining regime, the average rent, the average collection of taxes in the mining sector was very dismal. It was very, very low. It was a meager 1.62% of, of the GDP between 2003 and 2017. Let's compare that data to other countries. Mongolia, which now is a, clearly a mining country, collects about 18.5% of mining rents. Laos, which is an emerging mining economy, collects about 8%. So very big difference in terms of the tax return to the national, in, to the national coffers. Um, Recently, Indonesia, for example, implemented several taxation policies to capture more windfall profits from the mining sector. So clearly, there's an argument to make about the need to tax the mining sector more tax effectively in order to get the most out of the commodity boom. So mining contribution did not substantially change. It didn't improve despite the high prices. And in part, that has to do with the lack of regulatory reforms, particularly on taxation. Again, as I said, the emphasis of Arroyo back then was to open the sector for foreign investment. And so taxation was the least of uh, her concern, um, you know, because you can't attract foreign investment if you're increasing the tax 
in mining. In addition, if we compare the Philippines spending on infrastructure, it was much, much lower on average compared to other Southeast Asian countries. On average, China, uh, South Korea, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, most of the Asian countries are spending at about 30 to 35% of their GDP back on manufacturing and infrastructure. Philippines is about 10 to 15 percent, depending on the data. There's a paper that I published in 2019 looking at this. So we think that the main issue was that the mining reforms uh, uh, focused a lot on uh, um, uh, 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 attracting foreign investment without building capabilities within the domestic sector. It then focused on improving the productivity of local firms, for example. In terms of tax collection, there was very little effort to improve it. In addition to the lack of regulatory reform on taxes, large-scale miners under the 1995 Mining Act already enjoys a lot of tax holidays and exemptions. There was an IMF study commissioned, and the study looked at the, the, the tax uh, situation in the Philippines, and one of the key conclusions is there are overlapping, confusing taxation rules. But at the same time, a lot of these uh, big, uh, potentially big taxpayers are escaping because we have a lot of uh, uh, legislations that allow them to be exempted. In addition, the EO79 by Aquino was largely ineffective in addressing the tax question. And I think partly this has to do with the fact that you need a law rather than an executive order for this. Um, mining elites, in Congress have blocked the new legislation. So that's one of the first dynamic. So state capacity reforms to address tax question would just never pass um, because a lot of our uh, congressmen have interests in the mining sector, particularly those in Mindanao um, and in Visayas. But secondly, uh, um, there, was a, there was an apparent threat uh, that you know, if you impose a new tax law, FDI will not come into the mining sector. So there was a clear policy orientation to attract FDI, and therefore it appeared that uh, Kino did not move away from this idea that you need FDI to develop the sector. Therefore, mining reforms were piecemeal mostly, and they don't really cohere around a strategic in, uh, plan in order to maximize the benefits from mining. The second aspect of why we think mining reforms have failed in the Philippines over the past 20 years is because it doesn't address some of the fundamental problems that are created by mineral extraction. Um, in particular, the need to create legitimacy and the need to, to, to create a governing coalition between the state and civil society. Mining extraction produces different kinds of social contracts between states and citizens. And companies, depending on what kind of company they are, they play a mediating role. The Mining Act legitimizes, as I said, private sector-driven models of, of development. But in particular, they also emphasize conflict management through voluntary codes of conduct. In the 1995 Mining Act, one of the core features of conflict management there is A, collect the taxes to compensate, um, and then B, rely on corporate social responsibility, CSR activities. One of the things that are often implement, uh, that are uh, established in, in the law is the, uh, the need for companies to have a social development and management program, SMDP. What this basically means is that the company should build a relationship with the community. Oftentimes, citizens, communities have interpreted this as a goodwill act of, of the company, as opposed to a regulatory obligation to the communities impacted disproportionately by mining. Um, in a way, I think the main issue is conflicts are being dealt with between the company and the community without any kind of regulatory framework in which the state can come in and, uh, and, and look closely. So we, in some cases, you see paternalistic ties between companies and communities. We've done interviews with the uh, National Commission of Indigenous Peoples, NCIP, 
NCIP has been uh, defunded in the past 10, 15 years. So they don't actually have the ability to, to, you know, to, to deal with the grievances of indigenous communities. In addition, some of the civil society organizations we interviewed argued that the, ND, the, the National Commission of Indigenous People, the NCIP, were sometimes facilitating contracts on behalf of the mining companies. So what we see here are conflict management tactics on the part of the state that promote FDI, that promote the benefits uh, of mining, as opposed to having a view where you allow the company, the, the community to decide whether they want the mining to continue or to expand or not. Now, here I think when we talk about the, the, the need for, or for, a legit, for legitimacy in, in mining, we see different dynamics taking place. So on the one hand, um, it, because of the lack of uh, a, a mechanism for the state to regulate mining, a lot of the large scale mining activities have often faced, faced periodic opposition from civil society. And then secondly, at the regional or subnational level, you have very, very big differences between the communities. The extent to which communities will oppose mining depends on the poverty conditions and the political dynamics within these uh, at the subnational level. And here it's quite important to compare uh, uh, provinces, communities in the Philippines. So for example, in Surigao del Norte, where uh, there was uh, the poverty levels are higher and that there are no alternative livelihoods, people tend to be very supportive of the mining industry. They actually like the idea that there's mining, even if there are socio-environmental costs attached to it. By contrast, places like Romblon, where you have marble, fishing, agriculture, there's a lot more opposition against mining because the environmental costs are too high. So without a national uh, uh, sort of consensus building policy, or, or a, a, a politics of, of bargaining with the different communities, I think it then it is then left to to the communities to deal with them and 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 the and the and the elites uh, at the subnational level. So mining reforms that were implemented over the uh, since 1995 failed to capture these dynamic local conditions, um, and sometimes it directly contradicts some of the decentralization efforts as well. And this is why we see differences in terms of how LGUs respond to mining. Some of them defend mining. Some of them facilitate rent capture. You know, they want more rents. Um, and some of them uh, are, um, they, 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 they mobilize against uh, mining at all completely. So different kinds with, with very patchy uh, role for the state. Now, at the end of this, I think the main issue is, you know, um, the need for the state to have a much clearer position over mining. And I actually thought, you know, when Duterte came to power, uh, that he was doing that. There was an anti-mining discourse immediately upon assuming office, principally because one of the most uh, uh, affected regions when it comes to mining, when it comes to the environmental effects of mining is Mindanao, where he comes from. So one of the first attempt he did was to appoint Gina Lopez, and a, a, fa a famous uh, she, she's known as an environmentalist. Under Gina Lopez, she tried to close at least forty-four mines who did not meet the regulatory requirements. Now, the problem was that that created a backlash, not only against Gina Lopez but also against the interest mining interests who back up Duterte. So we have to remember, for example, that um, some of the people who funded Duterte's electoral campaign were connected to mining. They're mining shareholders. So Dominguez, uh, the Villars, Mendoza, who's connected to uh, the Villars. So there is a very strong lobby not seen in the public, not directly uh, uh, you know, um, at the front, uh, who support mining. And so Gina Lopez's policy actually contradicted this, which is what explains why Duterte slowly moved away, gradually moved away from her, which led to Simato being appointed uh, uh, as DNR secretary. Importantly, I think for a lot of reasons, mining reforms were placed at the back burner under Duterte. We don't talk about mining anymore so much. And so we don't actually know what kind of reforms he will put in place in the last two years. 
but also that um, it kind of went on a standstill in terms of uh, mining. There's a different uh, focus under Duterte. Some of the lessons that we would learn from uh, uh, studying the Philippines, but also broadly in this project, because as I said, this is an UNRIS project that compared different countries. The first lesson that we draw across cases, not just Philippines, Mongolia, there's like four other cases, uh, is that the priorities of the IFIs on state capacity building seem to be misplaced. The logic of emphasizing FDI does not strengthen state, ability, state capabilities that are specifically aimed at addressing the adverse effects of mining. So without strong institutional capacity to address the regulatory requirements to deal with the environmental effects, socio-environmental effects of mining, developmental effects of mining, we won't see stronger, uh, uh, better poverty outcomes. Um, so state capacity is central not only to mining itself, but to poverty reduction as well. Theoretically, our paper tries to build a, a, a framework where we emphasize two aspects of institutional capabilities, the extractive and infrastructural power of the state. Um, there are good examples where uh, resource extraction has gone beyond this logic of regulatory state building that is based on promoting FDI, especially when it comes to financing welfare programs through mineral taxes. So the Latin American examples are good cases to look at here. Uh, but I think what's important, the end point of the paper is that without uh, emphasizing with limited infrastructural power, you invoke the exacerbation of conflicts. You delegitimize mining as a development model. Now, this is not to say that we should promote mining. I think what we're trying to argue in the paper is in countries where mining is an option for a development strategy, if the state and the citizen decide that they want to pursue mining, you need certain types of institutional capacity, state capacities to make it work. And that's really the, the core argument of the paper. You're not going to get this even if high prices come in, even if you have more mineral rents coming in. You need to have a conscious effort to build political capacity to tax and allocate rents and also to, to build a, a, an institutionalized mechanism to manage the conflicts associated with the resource sector. And I will stop there. Thank you.